Good morning again. This is Chris Merritt, uh, State Historic Preservation Officer for Utah for part two of this multi-part sequence on Chinese railroad workers in Utah. If you haven't seen part one, the thumbnail is kind of an overview of why Chinese workers were here in the first place and how they were employed by the railroad. This part is more focused on the Utah story. So I like to start here. Due to the way we treated Chinese and other immigrants in the 19th century, history was not kind. History omitted a lot of their stories. And when you look at the 11 to 13,000 Chinese railroad workers who helped build the Central Pacific Line, we have extremely few faces and names and very few even within that pool where we can actually tie a face and a name together. A review of the Southern Pacific Bulletin, which was a newsletter put out by the Southern Pacific Railroad, who took over operations of the Central Pacific Line, west of Promontory, uh, by Mike and Ann Polk, actually identified a series of Chinese men with some photos. And so these are pretty rare historical documents where we can actually put a face and a name together. A second major thing to look at is look at the years of service in that column second from the right. Ahab, uh, which Ah is just a historical name that it was applied to a lot of Chinese immigrants. It really means nothing more than Mr. Uh, but he had 49 years and six months in service when he retired in 1920. He was hired in 1871, working as probably a section gang laborer in Nevada and Utah, but worked 50 years for the railroad before being retired. And to put it in perspective, a lot of these folks lived in a period where there weren't really retirement or pension plans. So he started as a laborer, probably in his 20s, retired as a laborer 50 years later in his mid 70s. And so that same job existed. Unlike the Japanese, Greeks, Italians that replaced Chinese labor later, the Chinese never seemed to get much higher than a laborer, a machinist helper, an engine wiper for the railroads. And that is a real view of the sort of racist box we put them in. The very bottom, Anan, another person that we don't have a name to, but he had over 49 plus years of experience. But he started in 1866 when they were still tunneling through the Sierra Nevada mountains. And so that's a pretty epic career that sadly we don't know too much about. So I ended the last phase talking about the construction of the railroad and how it arrived in Utah in March of 1869 and finished where that purple star is at Promontory Summit on May 10th with that epic ceremony. But I wanna take the story further. So as soon as that famous photo was taken, there was thousands of Chinese workers and others, including Irish, Civil War veterans, African-Americans, Mormons, working backwards to improve these lines because this was built for speed and not quality. If you look at this yellow line of the railroad, uh, the Union Pacific came in from the right of the screen all the way to the Purple Star. The Central Pacific came in from the left of the screen all the way to the star. But after 1869, Chinese labor became the main section crew force for both halves of this line. Very few, if any, Chinese were employed on the Union Pacific portion for construction, but after completion, they replaced most of the section crews all the way back into Nebraska. And so that was a real testament to how hard the Chinese were working and how easy and cheap labor they were to acquire. So this line, because it was built for speed, not quality, the crews were already working on May 10th to stabilize trussels, rebuild culverts, to do water diversions, to do all the features of a modern railroad. And then for the next 40 years, those same workers were out here in the middle of nowhere building and maintaining the line. Now, steam engines needed lots of water and coal. And so that meant that you had to have base stations spaced every so often for the steam engines to refill. But you also need to have a base station for those section crews who were maintaining a section of line to make sure that every time a train goes by and bends a piece of rail or there's a railroad tie failure, that they're out there replacing it. And so these section lines, when you look at the west uh, part of Utah, we, we have it kind of split into two parts. We have big towns, Lucin, Terrace, Kelton, Corinne. Corinne's the only one today that still has a population, and that's outside Brigham City, Utah. But then all these little sections or sidings of Tacoma and Bovine and Matlin. So these little locations, there was 10 to 15 Chinese workers and two Irish foremen. The 1870 and 1880 census pretty much show that pattern. 
those Chinese crews were out there seven days a week, uh, limited time off. Um, sometimes if they did get days off, they would go into a bigger community like a terrace or Corinne where there's a larger Chinatown. But that was your life out there in the middle of nowhere in northwestern Utah, maintaining this railroad with two guys from Ireland. Pretty interesting social situation, if you ask me. So I'm a census nerd. So I went through the state census for uh, railroad workers, particularly the Chinese demographics. And if you look at the 1870 census, so that's that next April after the railroad's completion, there's about 350 identified Chinese railroad workers in Utah. By 1880, uh, it was a little over 100, but then look at 1900. This is truly a representation of the impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Uh, that Exclusion Act, as a reminder, barred the immigration of Chinese men. And so that meant that the Chinese here were getting older and they were also becoming less in number. And so by 1900, the railroads were looking to other ethnic groups to replace that dwindling Chinese labor pool. The average age also increases because of the Exclusion Act. In 1870, the average railroad worker was about 27 years old, but by 1900, there were 44. And that's mean they're veterans. They've been on the railroad for 20 years at that point. And this is really, there's no young labor replacing the older men. So tariffs, which is kind of the crowning jewel, in my opinion, of the railroad, is out in far western Box Elder County. Back in 1870, this place was booming. 800 to 1,000 people were residing along the railroad grade in this town that just sprung up from nothingness. It was so big because of the railroad's need for maintenance shops, which I'll show here in a second. But secondarily, throughout the mid-1870s and even into the early 1880s, there was a series of gold rushes and silver rushes up in the Grass Creek Mountains and parts of Nevada and parts of northwestern Utah that allowed this little community to grow with post office, a two-story train depot, uh, libraries, a garden, uh, two, sal or two hotels, multiple saloons, a bakery, dry goods stores, actually a bustling little community. By 1900, this was all gone. I'll explain why. So this is downtown Terrace, about 1875. This is downtown Terrace, 2019. And so you can see the uh, little bit of foundation remnants right here. Uh, this would have been underneath one of those wood frame structures, this would have been a small cellar, and then the wood frame here, and then repeat. The other problem we've had at Terrace is a lot of systematic looting and vandalism at this site has occurred. This is now managed by the Bureau of Land Management and thus protected uh, for its antiquities, but people still go out here, metal detect and hunt for bottles, ripping pages from our history book. And so as a community, we need to stop doing this behavior to make sure we have the ability to tell the stories of people that we don't really know much about. But this is the reason for Terrace's existence. This is a 11-bay uh, roundhouse and turntable. So steam engines like this one, this is a wood-fired uh, steam engine, probably Central Pacific Railroad. This needed a lot of maintenance. All that soot, all that coal dust, all that rust needed to be constantly maintained and fixed and cleaned. So you needed a place that you could take its steam engine and its tender off, put it in a bay for maintenance. And so Terrace was the main roundhouse between Elko and Ogden for many years. So that also meant there was a need for a lot of employment. So 100 to 200 people had to be employed at Terrace just to maintain the operations of the railroad. So a turntable is basically a giant wooden Lazy Susan for steam engines. And so it's sitting on it right now from the gentleman on the left all the way to the gentleman on the right, this is a giant round turntable that could spin the steam engine all the way around, back it into a bay, pull it back out when it's done being cleaned, turn to a rail line, and off she goes. Now, this is what it looks like today. So we have the edge of the back of the roundhouse, and then you see these little berms. These are the ash piles that were underneath those bays. So you can't see a lot on the ground today because Terrace was basically removed by 1900 piece by piece, and then fire took care of the rest. But you can still see some of these physical remnants. So Terrace really declined in 1900 because the railroad decided to build across the Great Salt Lake, cutting off this arm of the railroad. By 1904, there was really nobody or anything left. So the, this big bustling town, one of the biggest in Box Elder County, faded within a decade. 
At Terrace, more interestingly for our story today, was the third largest Chinatown in Utah in the 1870 census, only behind Ogden and Corinne. Um, there's 57 enumerated Chinese workers out here in 1870, but they don't appear really well in newspaper records, railroad records, and even the few maps we have of Terrace don't show a Chinese community, but the stuff on the ground does. This is where archaeology is helping to piece together a mo more cohesive story because the Chinese have been omitted from most of the mainstream history records. And so these artifacts on the screen are all Chinese. The upper left is a bamboo pattern porcelain bowl. This is your standard workers bowl. On the right is a four flowers or a four seasons pattern bowl. Uh, it has a maker's stamp on there. And the bottom left is actually the shoulder of a, a ginger jar. So they imported dried ginger. All of these objects were manufactured in China and brought to Utah for consumption. And so Chinese material culture is pretty unique. And I'll do a follow up later uh, during this shutdown. Uh, smaller communities like Matlin, these are where there would have been a bunkhouse, a foreman's house, a water tank, a coal bin, and maybe a shop house to maintain like a little pump cart. Um, now, not a whole lot left. That two track road on the right of the photo, that's actually the Transcontinental Railroad grade. The Bureau of Land Management manages this for your uh, recreation. And so you can drive 87 miles of the original transcontinental alignment. We have the biggest segment in the country and it's all public land. And so it's all our responsibility to keep it and maintain it. At Matlin, we did discover this bowl that we did collect for the BLM. This is actually the base of one of those bamboo style bowls, but you see the character has been actually pecked in to the base. We haven't known a lot about this practice. And then working with the Chinese descendant community, we have figured out that in Wuyi province, which is in Southeast China, this is a common practice of pecking a family surname into a bowl. Um, this goes back well past the 19th century. So it's kind of cool because this one artifact takes it from just a broken piece of porcelain back to a province in China and to probably a person, a 20, 25 year old man that left his family behind and then continued this cultural practice in, in Utah. I think those are powerful stories. Um, we have done some limited inventories. Canon Heritage Consulting has done a lot of work out here documenting um, BLM land, some of these sites like uh, Ambe. Um, but ultimately that story ends. Um, by 1900, the Chinese population was collapsing on the railroad because of the Exclusion Act. And the blue line there on the screen, the original alignment of the Transcontinental Railroad, became less and less important after the Southern Pacific Railroad sponsored the construction of the Lucin or Great Salt Lake Cutoff, which on this map is the red line. Well, that blue line after 1904's completion of Lucin Cutoff didn't die, it just became less and less important. Local ranchers, sheep ranchers, and even parts of Southern Idaho still relied on that railroad access to get people and services in and out. But ultimately by 1942, the blue line from Lucin on the west all the way to Corinne was abandoned. Uh, the rail was ripped up, used for World War II, the cut ties were pulled off, and the original railroad bed was used as a county road for many years. But now from Promontory, all the way out to Lucin, you can drive this route and see the trestles and the culverts and some of the archaeology out there, uh, which is really a tremendous, um, you know, world heritage site, in my opinion, because of the role of all this international labor, how this reshaped what we did in the American West. Think about that blue line from 1869 until 1904. All the freight and passenger travel going through the center part of the United States went across that line. So the 1870s booms in the West, all the supplies were coming across this blue line and what history that saw. And so after 1900, the Chinese railroad workers faded, the railroads went to new groups, and this line became less and less, but now it's part of your public land. So I'd like to thank, in closing, Bureau of Land Management, Park Service, Utah State University's museum um, and Molly Cannon, Ken Cannon Heritage Consultants, Mike and Ann Polk. And then of course, we've had a great long-term relationship with the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association. And you know what? That is really the point of archeology span is to connect the community to their history. And where the Chinese were omitted from a lot of mainstream history, it's important for us to reserve those places on the ground and those objects that tell us that full story. Thank you so much for listening.